For a lot of 3D artists, achieving realism is both their highest goal and their biggest pain in the ass. But I think this video can make your life a little easier because with the right tricks, you can make any project a realism masterpiece. Oftentimes you'll hear realism is very hard to achieve in 3D, requiring years of painstaking skill to reach. And I guess they're not wrong if you're going for cinema level quality. But a simple still image, which in my opinion looks really realistic, can be done in a matter of hours if you know what you're doing that is. So let's pull back the curtain and show what it takes for you to create an image like that. I'm pretty sure that if I ask you to look at a photo and decide on what makes it real, I'd get dozens of different answers. I've narrowed these down to three main forces. The subject, the lighting, the camera. And these three forces combine together to what I like to call the Triforce of 3D Realism. Here's a great example of that. This animation by Ryan Zomorati showcases it beautifully using only simple models in a simple scene. But the combination of model quality, environment, natural lighting, and in this case a hero role for the camera work had many believed that this was real. Even going so far as to the post being removed from the Blender subreddit because it was judged as being fake, or better said, actual footage. And you can't blame them, even after watching this thing a hundred times on loop, it's still practically impossible to tell if this is CG. And that's why understanding even on just a basic level how to apply this Triforce of realism correctly will make your work significantly more realistic instantly. But how do you do this? Let's begin with the true basis of it all. Whether it's a model, a character, or an environment, the subject is crucial to things looking realistic. With amazing surface details, realistic materials, and a fitting surrounding being major aspects of its potential to be viewed as real. To make your own, you're probably going with modeling and texturing. But it would require years of practice in both of these skills to become good enough to create a model that could fool somebody into being real. Instead, we can take a huge shortcut in creating realistic models by using the power of 3D scanning. Using this technique will let you capture minute details, imperfections, textures, and the most complex geometry you can think of in a matter of minutes. It's so incredibly powerful and very accessible these days as you no longer need an expensive DSLR camera or incredible studio setups. All you really need is the one device that we all carry with us all day anyways a phone, and maybe technically a 3D scanning app. Now my personal 3D scanning app of choice is Kiri, who to be fully transparent also sponsored this video, but after having tried several other scanning apps, I can truly say that Kiri is a great combination of usefulness, quality, and affordability, and it even has a 100% free version with full functionality, so no limits, no watermark, stuff like that, which is incredible if you're just getting started and don't want to invest yet. Now there is a caveat though, 3D scanning strongly relies on you as the user to generate good results. So understanding the basics of 3D scanning is quite important and since good models are part of the holy trinity of realism, let's get into how to properly photo scan. Kerry actually has something called featureless object scan which uses neural surface reconstruction, a technique similar to Gaussian splatting, to generate incredible results easily. But we'll cover that more later since it's only part of the pro plan and I want to keep this accessible for those of you who want to use the free version of Kiri. So on the basic plan, you're left with the usual method of taking photos of your objects. But trust me, that's not a bad thing because photo scans, although more work than the featureless object scan, will always turn out better in terms of level of detail and texture clarity. For the projects used in this video, I only scanned outdoors, but more on that in a bit. Now funnily enough, the quality of your scans depends entirely on the same three forces as realism in 3D. First of all, you need good objects, which are readable by the 3D scan algorithm. These are objects with a lot of feature points. Now, if we take a look at this object, for example, here, these are feature points. Basically, these are standout features that can be read by the algorithm and thus are useful to interpret the shape of the object. A featureless object, on the other hand, is an object which doesn't have much shape or color definition and mostly feels flat to the algorithm, resulting in a worse scan. Now, if we're using the featureless object scan, we don't actually require a object with a lot of feature points. Anyways, you want to put 
put your object on an even background with a bit of texture like wood or stone, ideally with as little clutter in the background as possible. Although even with a rougher setup, Kiri tends to do a great job. Once you have decided on your object of choice and have a proper area to record it in, the second aspect comes into play lighting, which to me is actually the hardest part to get right with 3D scanning. So when scanning indoor, you want your lighting to be soft, one color and uniformly in strength all around your object. This can be really hard to do though without a proper studio setup. So instead I'd recommend shooting in a room with a lot of natural light, but make sure to not put your object in direct sunlight. Try aiming for ambient light. Otherwise your object will get strong contrast, which is very noticeable in your scans, like in these for example. Outdoor scanning on the other hand is actually easier because you can use nature's softbox provided you have the right weather. Overcast days. Overcast, cloudy weather creates natural soft lighting resulting in an even lighting for your object. Honestly, this method is what I prefer in almost all cases and we get a lot of cloudy weather anyways in the Netherlands so <laughs> it's quite easy to do as well. Sorry LA folks, I know you always have sun but if that's the case, make sure to scan inside of a shadow so there's no direct sunlight hitting the object. But assuming you have overcast weather, like I do often, scanning outdoors is super super simple and convenient. And this is when part 3 comes into action for 3D scanning, the camera. So using the Kiri app, you can take up to 100 photos nowadays in the basic plan and up to 300 in the pro version. Now you want to take these as steadily as possible using your phone's camera, making sure you have some overlap of the object between each photo. Kiri actually does an amazing job of guiding you through this, telling you when you're messing up and showing you how far along the process you are. You can either rotate around your object holding the phone or you can rotate the object with the phone on a stand so it's nice and balanced for every shot. If possible I'd recommend going for this since the results are almost always better. Just make sure to enable auto object masking when uploading so the algorithm knows to isolate the key subject. Kiri offers manual exposure settings which will result in better scans but if you're lazy like me the automatic settings are just fine in almost all cases. In less controlled environments, especially outdoor, using the featureless object scan function is a lifesaver. It does such an amazing job because it uses a completely different technique as opposed to photo scanning. It uses an AI neural surface reconstruction method that takes video as input. So simply rotating around your object, recording it without trying to ensure overlap and good exposure is more than enough. It works wonders for practically any object. After finishing your recording or photos, the scans are automatically uploaded and processed. You can then edit the scans within the app to remove any unwanted background elements or for example, a floor object. But you could also do this inside of Blender, of course. Within the pro plan, you can also have the app automatically convert the scans to uniform quad meshes, which is amazing and it can generate PBR textures for ultra realistic 3D models, making getting an incredible result that much easier. Now what I like about 3D scanning in particular, no matter the platform or app that you use, is that it captures so much detail. It does an amazing job of recording tiny blemishes, details and other small bits and bobs which are truly the difference between a CG looking model and something real. Assuming you've done all of the above properly, you can get amazing results super fast. It does take a bit of practice, but anyone can do it as long as you have a mobile device to work with. I think on average, each of these scans took about 30 minutes to do, including waiting on it to process in the app. If you want to try out Kiri, again, it's 100% free with the basic plan. Use the link in the description to get started. And if you convert to a pro plan within the first 48 hours, you're getting 40% off on their annual subscription fee, which is big savings. Oh, and as a nice bonus, in their pro version, they just added auto rigging, which will generate automatic rigs for your scans, which you can use to some pretty hilarious effect. Anyways, at this point, you should have a proper subject for your realistic shot a gorgeous 3D model or two, and some environment scans that make up your scene. Which brings us to the next Triforce of Realism. Now I can't stress enough the importance of lighting. I've made several videos on lighting already and even just released a full introductory course on lighting in Blender over on CG Cookie because lighting is literally the sauce that makes the dish. In this particular case, we need natural light that feels real and using reference can be such a good starting point. For practice, you can take a photo, then recreate it as closely as possible by scanning the same object that is in your photo, lighting it using the reference and adding a proper camera, constantly going back to that reference image, which you now have as a very handy guide. 
Now, the key with lighting here is twofold. First of all, we need to think of our scene in a way of it being real. In this scene, for example, what is the setting? What is visible beyond our camera bounds creating the light for this object? Is it laying in grass or is it on a desk in a dark room at night and there's not a whole lot of light in this room? Is it an extremely sunny day or is it gloomy weather? Thinking of the scene in this way provides context that will guide both your lighting and your camera. So assuming you've done that for your scene, you should now know or have a general idea of what the light should be like. Now, second, it's important to aim for the goal, not for realism. Does it make sense to have only one single light source in an outdoor shot? Yes. Does it also look the most realistic? No, almost 100% of the time it does not, because in a photo there's tons of things going on outside of your camera again. These things provide bounce lighting, additional light sources, shadows, and that's why having reflectors in the form of color planes or actual objects to add bounce light, adding subtle additional lighting, and making sure that there's reflective light and shadows, again based on this sort of fictional scene inside of your mind and outside of your camera bounce, will ensure a realistic result. Using HDRIs can provide a ton of colored lighting that looks very natural and provides a great starting point for any realistic scene. But even with that, it's still good to emphasize things with highlights, block light at certain points to create shadows, use gobos for a natural effect with leaves or blinds, and to add multiple light sources, creating some fill lighting. Now, for example, my go-to is to use an HDRI as the basis with low strength just to provide some colored fill lighting. Then I use an area light with or without a gobo to create the main light source. Maybe an additional area light for filling in some shadows to make these softer and less dark. And finally, adding bounce lighting planes and objects that create additional reflections and light for a realistic result. And sometimes I add in a volumetric cube, which is just a simple cube with a volume scatter node attached to the volume socket of the material with a very low intensity and a high anisotropy that goes a long way for adding some additional atmospheric lighting. So to wrap this up, Study your reference and aim for the best looking light, not the most sensible per se. And with that, we're left with the final Triforce of Realism. Very similar to the initial point for lighting, we have to ask ourselves, what is it we're seeing here? What is the scenario for this image to take place? Are we using a phone to quickly make a photo of something? Are we creating a deliberate photo using a DSLR camera? Is it a recording on an older device or a VCR camera? All of these questions determine how to set up the camera, not in terms of location or angle, but more so in focal length, depth of field, or grain and other settings. And so after determining what kind of shot your project is, you can simply look up details for that type of camera and mimic the lens as best as possible in Blender. And not only should you mimic the lens, but also the way the sensor handles the light and image. By looking up plenty of reference or ideally creating your own, you can find what makes a specific camera unique and copy that. This could be finneting, bloom, camera noise, or also grain, or maybe lens distortion. You name it, you can add it in. Now, some of these settings or techniques will require compositing to manually add them, and that's because Blender or 3D apps in general create perfect images without our help. So by taking, for example, a box mask or ellipse mask, blurring it with a blur node, and using an alpha over node to combine these with the original image, you can can really quickly add a vignette. Lens distortion is just another node you can simply add in at the end of your compositing tree. Just make sure you use very, very low values or it will look fake as hell. Grain is a matter of adding a texture, adding it to the compositor via a texture node and combining this with a mix color node to add the grain in. You can set the skill to match the sort of noise that your camera would get. And by setting it to linear light, you're getting grain in the dark areas, which is common for cameras. And by setting it to overlay, you're getting it more in the highlights, which is again common in certain cameras. But if you copy those settings as best as possible and pair this up with lighting in a great looking photo scan, there's zero chance that your final image won't look incredibly realistic. Will you get it right first try? Probably not, but try it several times, experiment with lenses, lighting, and photo scanning, and after a few attempts, you'll be creating realistic artworks in no time. Make sure to check out Kiri through the link in the description and get started with photo scanning right now to make realistic renders. And if you're unsure about how to use lighting in Blender still, make sure to check out this video here to learn all about it.